Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And um, I'm really excited to be here. So it's my first time at COC, but uh, also in Bratislava. So um, yeah, I'd like to just extend my gratitude to the organizers uh, for inviting me here. And um, yeah, a little bit about myself. So I'm Niharika. Um, I am a lawyer by qualification. So um, I believe and I assume that uh, I'm a bit of an outlier here at this conference. But uh, that's, that's great because, you know, it always fills me with a lot of uh, newer insights. And um, yeah, and I work at um, FSFB. And today I'm also going to be speaking as a consortium member of uh, the Zoom project, which is uh, funded by the European Commission. And um, the project basically um, develops tools and guidance for companies, startups, um, software developers, um, to basically help them um, understand um, appropriate um, licensing strategies for their business models um, when it's modeled across uh, the three O's. So open, open data, open hardware, and open source software. So um, I will just quickly deep dive, um, deep dive into my presentation now and talk about um, what I'm excited to be speaking on. So there's this really important topic uh, these days, which I think affects all of us uh, in the FOSS community, and that is uh, this concerning trend of proliferation of AI licenses with additional behavioral restrictions that are based on um, ethical considerations. And this, this has been a subject of much debate and discussions um, these days. So um, at the outset, I just want to make it uh, extremely clear that you know there's no need of having um, everything labeled as open and free, and uh, sometimes the law also prohibits it. But um, as you know, the term open source or uh, free software actually carries a very positive connotation for people. And so indulging into um, or engaging in open washing is basically um, a great PR tool for most companies. But what is actually really concerning here is um, not just that uh, you know they're engaging in open washing and um, using uh, restrictive terms and conditions in their licenses, but also, which by the way, you know, is um, kind of like a nightmare for any um, compliance and legal department in any company. But also, by virtue of having these restrictive terms and conditions in their licenses, which are based on, apparently based on ethical considerations, they're also undermining the ethical uh, movement that the entire FOSS movement is about. So the ethical movement of free and open source uh, movement in itself. And um, yeah, I really want to um, sort of talk more about how it is um, an ethical movement per se. And for that, I would like to uh, begin with uh, giving a brief uh, overview of uh, the free and open source uh, definitions respectively. And I know that this is a brilliant crowd which already knows the differences between the two. But for anybody who is uh, starting off new into the FOSS world and uh, who's probably come for, uh, come, uh, for the first time to this conference um, and wants to know more about these definitions, Quickly, um, the term free software, basically the definition provides for four freedoms. So the freedom to study, use, share, and improve. And open source uh, basically is um, curated by OSI. So free software is by Free Software Foundation and open source is by Open Source Initiative, which provides that um, open source is just not access to the source code, but it goes Beyond that, and um, basically, uh, you need to also comply with these criteria mentioned here. Now, there are multiple reasons for engaging with um, free software. So, um, as you know, while proprietary licenses are fundamentally incompatible with each other, free licenses, uh, free software licenses, on the other hand, um, are well standardized, well documented, and have withstood the complex legal issues. Um, um, in the course of um, so many years that, um, since its existence. And uh, it also seeks to avoid this problem of license proliferation by increasing the legal interoperability and um, allowing the license adoption to be easier. Um, so safe to say that you know the FOSS uh, movement has basically uh, transformed the development of um, the, the software development over the decades. And um, earlier, you know, the proprietary systems used to 
lock-in users, provided no access, and that basically stagnated innovation. But free software licenses, on the other hand, or um, codes such as Apache or MIT just, uh, you know, opened the code and just allowed a lot of um, global um, collaboration, which also enhanced um, or fostered a lot of uh, technical or innovation. So um, now when I juxtapose this to the concept of ethics that we're here to talk about, um, safe to say that free software or open source software actually contributes to um, reciprocity. It contributes to social justice, digital commons. Um, it promotes um, altruism um, and so on and so forth. So it in itself is an ethical movement, um, in my opinion. And um, that's great news because uh, free software and open source software actually powers much of the Internet's infrastructure, including key machine learning frameworks and um, uh, projects uh, and libraries such as Linux and Kubernetes and PyTorch. So um, basically, the FOSS is an indispensable part of AI research and development. And um, it also promotes, uh, I mean, I would uh, rather say that um, it is a contributory, contributory factor to the AI fairness, um, explainability, transparency. So it creates or aids in creating this robust framework for AI to exist. But AI systems don't necessarily um, operate like traditional software. They have uh, multiple interconnected components, such as the training data, um, the model architecture, uh, algorithms, tokenizers, etc. And they require distinct development processes and rely on specialized resources, which are mostly available at the hands of um, a few big tech companies. So although the ideology of open AI is uh, mapped or, um, or the, the ideology of um, free software and open source software is mapped into the concept of open AI. They don't really uh, operate um, similarly just because of the virtue of how they're built differently. And there are a lot of components at play here. So sometimes the, the code around the model might be open source, but um, the, the model in itself is not uh, open source. Or the, the weights are open source or the model isn't open source. And so while the number of um, publicly available AI models are increasing um, in the coming years or have already increased, are growing in number by the day, um, what is particularly concerning is um, the popularization of the term open. And um, largely, the term open is being used to denote um, few maximally or minimally open or minimally reusable, minimally transparent uh, AI systems. And so if you must apply the traditional definition of free and open source software to AI systems, then we must um, also respect the key pillars that actually make them free and open, which are transparency, reusability, oversight, and enablement. So transparency um, would, in the in the context of AI systems, would mean just access to the source code, um, to be able for anybody to be able to you know vet the source code or inspect it. Reusability would be to uh, the ability for a third party to reuse the source code. Um, oversight is again you know just the ability to vet the source code and inspect it, um, which also by the way um, reduces this uh, discriminatory effects of AI systems. And enablement is uh, basically, you know, dis uh, disclosing sufficient details about the AI systems. So for anybody to be able to develop uh, the same AI model, uh, provided that they have uh, the sufficient um, resources as identified by the AI community. And um, yeah, so as you know, now the definition of uh, open source AI is actually a very encumbered one, specifically because of two reasons. So, um, first of all, this uh, definition of open AI, or, or rather of AI systems, we didn't really have a very robust definition uh, until now, but uh, now with the, with the enforcement of the AI Act, uh, that's, that things are going to improve. And uh, secondly, we didn't really have a robust definition for what openness in AI would mean. 
And here, I would really like to, um, you know, compliment um, OSI for this uh, huge initiative that they've taken for creating a robust uh, definition. And um, whilst doing this, they're not only taking the traditional four freedoms as provided by free software, so freedom to use, study, share, and improve, but they're also taking um, a wide spectrum of AI technologies uh, into concentration while defining what um, openness or open AI would mean. Um, and yeah, it's my pleasure to also announce that uh, leading partners of the Zoom consortium that I'm associated with are also aiding uh, towards this initiative together with OSI. And I believe uh, Apache Foundation is also uh, partnering uh, with OSI on this initiative. So we really have something uh, nice to look forward to, perhaps a robust framework of what openness and AI would mean, and which would uh, you know dispel all these... Um, uh, notions that we have uh, currently in the in the industry that uh, sort of water down the definitions of free and open source software. So um, until a definition has been finalized, what we see is that openness in AI actually exists on this long spectrum. It's on this long gradient where on one hand we have some maximally open um, AI efforts, such as uh, Luther AI, which is a nonprofit and has licensed its uh, AI model on um, Apache 2.0. And um, we have um, also this uh, GPT Neo, which is uh, managed by um, Luther AI. And uh, they've also made their documentation publicly available um, and uh, has also licensed the code uh, under MIT license. So we have that on one end. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, something like Llama 2 by Meta, which claims itself to be uh, open source, uh, but in reality levies a lot of restrictions and um, uh, is not really an open source uh, license. Uh, they also provide minimal transparency as to what sort of data is being used to train the AI model. So yeah, as we see that uh, the spectrum of the gradient is pretty vast, and uh, there are multiple projects that actually lie on this huge gradient. Um, right, so now um, what openness in AI, or rather let me just go back to the previous slide. Um, I also want to touch on the aspect that um, what openness in AI looks like in practice could vary considerably from making, um, or could include anything from making the documentation regarding its training and evaluation data set publicly available, to um, publicly releasing the data sheets, et cetera, or the model weights and the parameters. And um, yeah, so we don't really have a lot of clarity in that regard, and that's also something that OSI is currently working on. But if anybody wants to um, dig deep into this topic, I recommend uh, reading this paper by Suleiman and also one by David Vitter. And um, yeah, that's probably going to give you more insights about uh, this long spectrum of uh, openness in AI. But until we have this um, robust definition on what openness in AI would look like, any legitimate claim to open AI uh, must um, conform to the definitions of free and open source software. And um, yeah. But what's happening there is that um, in the last decade, we've seen multiple diverse groups and individuals and companies um, depart from exclusively using free and open source licenses to um, coming up with licensing solutions that basically restrict uh, or provide um, levy restrictions on um, various um, aspects such as uh, the field of endeavor, behavior, community management, commercial practice, and ethical incompatibility. So um, as we, um, all of us uh, would know that, you know, in 2021, a uh, hypocritic license was released by OES. And uh, basically, it specifically prohibited the use of free and open source software uh, in contravention to the universal standards of human rights. And this practice has now also spilled over to AI systems which has led to creation of some, code, some sort of um, suomoto ethics codes um, on AI systems and how they are used and further distributed. So for instance, we have uh, Llama 2 by Meta, and this has an entire appendix dedicated to a lot of 
say, wake up prohibitory uses, such as you know, any other criminal activity, violence or terrorism, etc. And um, yeah, we also have a newer version of it, Lama 3, and it also includes an identical appendix with the same restrictive um, clauses. And another one by Big Science Open a Real M license, um, which also has another rather weak um, licensing terms and conditions. And uh, yeah, so which is why I really want to talk about the implications of use of such licenses with additional behavior restrictions. Now, if you go back to these slides, and if we once again look at these terms and conditions, what we see is that um, these terms and conditions are absolutely vague, and uh, as a result of this, it causes like this broad um, prohibition or a, a broad uh, prohibitory use of any of these uh, licenses for their AI systems, and it rather has a very cascading effect on the downstream integration and application of AI systems. And um, as a result of it, you know, global collaboration becomes uh, a lot difficult, a uh, lot more difficult. And um, yeah, so then hurdles to adaption and improvement. This is caused by way of, say, um, unauthorizing any sorts of uh, derivative works or prohibiting any copyleft licenses. Um, hindrances to control over technology. Now, the result of this broad spectrum or broad um, yeah, spectrum of what openness and AI would look like basically results in um, vendor lock-in, providing less access to people. And this causes, of course, uh, barriers to reuse and um, control over technology in general and weakening of uh, oversight um, and transparency. So even though um, proprietary AI systems could be transparent, but free software and open source software provides more transparency in the way that it enables um, any, sorts of, any sort of um, auditing of the AI model. It just enables it to be more easy because it allows um, access to the source code and also the ability to, for anyone to improve it. Um, and, you know, since we now have a plethora of AI models released uh, on the market, um, by virtue of different regulations coming into place, what we have is now an obligation under different regulations to have these standardized risk assessments. And, uh, which, and free software and open source software actually helps and enables to make these audits easier and um, in turn also, you know, comply with the regulation. So, um, as conclusion, as a conclusion to our contribution to the Zoom project, uh, we've come up with four recommendations. So, first is to preserve the openness in AI. Um, then, keep the licenses interoperable with free software licenses. Now, we acknowledge that uh, you know uh, new and dedicated AI licenses is going to be a natural progression in the times to come, and it's a much desired phenomenon. We only plead, by virtue of these policy papers that we've drafted so far in the project, that these should be interoperable with the existing free and open source licenses, so as to maintain the sustainability, reusability, and accessibility of these AI systems. And uh, yeah, coming to this important topic of ethical compliance checks, so you know. Ethics as a subject is deeply rooted in societal values that differ from one jurisdiction to another. Yeah, and um, problems of transparency, accessibility, interpretability, explainability, all these problems make the deployment of AI systems ethically challenging. And so we must be extremely careful before embedding any kind of ethics into technologies. So what's happened is that the new latest development is that um, various AI researchers and developers have actually um, you know, found some sort of workaround or have come with a lot of good initiatives in, these regard, in this regard, um, such as you know, creating like um, a risk assessment framework for all these uh, open foundation models, or um, rather creating auditing tools that can audit the fairness, um, explainability, transparency of these AI models. 
and some have also established um, a dedicated ethics review board in um, different AI um, research labs. So, for example, uh, Meta has its own oversight board. Um, Google DeepMind has this uh, Responsibility and Security Council. Microsoft has its Aether board, uh, Aether committee. And so, what I mean to say is that there are various ways to ensure that AI systems are ethical. But to levy any sort of uh, restrictive terms and conditions by way of licensing is perhaps not the way out here. Um, and, you know, by way of having all these licenses that I've just mentioned, so Llama 2, etc., um, I acknowledge that perhaps the intention of Meta and other companies might be positive, but the application isn't. And so what I'm trying to, um, you know, the message that I'm trying to spread out here today and uh, also through this project is that um, um, any kind of restrictions placed on AI systems should actually, uh, which actually tackle the problem of uh, maintaining uh, the, or, um, you know, embedding ethics into AI should be within the purview of regulations and laws because Licenses are not a substitute for good governance, and licenses cannot be a substitute for legislation. So, yeah, uh, with that, um, I'd like to wrap up my talk. Um, I hope it was insightful. I'm looking forward to any questions that you would have. But um, I've also, you know, um, mentioned the policy brief and the Zoom project here. I encourage all of you to have a look at it. We have an interesting toolkit here, which actually is really helpful for software developers, for startups, for companies. Um, there is this policy brief uh, completely dedicated on this topic that we've, um, that I'm, I've uh, talked about today. And uh, yeah, I hope that more and more people get involved with this project and uh, spread the message because it is absolutely um, imperative for a community to be aware of this um, problem that we have today. So um, I'm looking forward to any questions.